Thank you, Dr. Sham Kalavalapalli. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now invite our chief guest, Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan Garu, to address the gathering. Friends, until I came here, I did not know what to expect. I expected a, a group of very accomplished medical professionals, many of them trained abroad, particularly, I think, in the United Kingdom, doing remarkable work in this country. I expected a lot of serious focus on medical care, but I did not really expect a deep reflection on health care. But after Dr. Shyam's presentation, I'm completely bowled over. There's not a word on which I would disagree. The vision you have is completely in consonance with what India needs. So really, I have nothing more to say, to be honest. I'm delighted that a group of high quality professionals are looking deeper. I'm particularly happy that he said, a doctor's role should not be limited to medical care. You have to be champions of health care in this country. I've been talking ad nauseum about it, and today I see it in practice. Thank you, Dr. Shyam, and all of you for doing what you're doing. You are an example of the good things happening in India in health care. Dr. Murli Bharadwaj talked about the irrelevance of clinical medicine in the normal sense, the inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, etc. I believe, as an old-fashioned guy, they still have a lot of relevance. But that apart, what he's saying is absolutely true. We read a lot of wonderful things in medical textbooks, but we hardly saw anything in practice. You went abroad with this knowledge, acquired the skills and expertise, and came back to us, and thank God for that, and then institutionalized those practices. And India is now able to provide the lowest cost care, meeting global standards in most of the cutting edge interventions. Thanks to all of you. And I salute you for that wonderful work you have been doing. And I believe that foundation is going to make an enormous difference for the future of healthcare in this country. You know, 2,500 years ago, a disciple of Socrates one day stood up and asked him a question. He said, Master, for years I've been listening to you and my other colleagues interacting on a variety of subjects, but I never once opened my mouth. Was it right or was it wrong for me to be silent, he asked. The master that Socrates was, he said, if you are a wise man, then you are a fool. If you are a fool, then you are a wise man. It will take a little bit of time for us to decipher that. What he meant was, if you are a wise man, if your ideas have some relevance to fellow human beings and their welfare, then you are a fool in having concealed your wisdom. But if you are a fool anyway, and you have nothing to say of any consequence to fellow human beings, you are a wise man in having concealed your ignorance. Now after hearing or listening to all of you in the last half an hour, 45 minutes, I would be very unwise to speak too much. So let me limit to a few ideas related to healthcare in continuation of what Dr. Shyam talked about. There's a magazine called, a journal called Dead Allus. It's the Journal of American Academy of Arts and Science. Some 45 years ago, Dead Allus wrote a piece about American medical care. He said, doing better, but feeling worse. That is American medicine. And that continues to be the case even today. Even today, about 33% of the patients postpone medical care or any kind of attention to uh, medical care for want of money. Even in case of serious, potentially dangerous morbidities, 25% of the patients postpone going to a doctor. Despite being the richest country on earth, despite spending 18 to 19% of GDP on health care, about half of it by the government, half of it through insurance in the private sector, America has remarkably poor outcomes. We all know the technology, the protocols, the standards are outstanding, but that doesn't matter if healthcare is not accessible and affordable to the bulk of the people. India certainly qualifies for this, doing better but feeling worse. 
And I believe we can do a lot at a very low cost. And that's the point that you're making. And I'm delighted when you talked about de-emphasizing hospitalization and focusing on primary care and outpatient care and taking advantage of the modern technologies. 60 million people, roughly the population of Britain, 60 million people are descending into poverty in this country every year on account of healthcare costs or lost income because of a disease unaddressed. 60 million people. Population equal to Britain is becoming poor every year, descending into poverty. You know, when we look at poverty line, we think it's a stable line and continuously people are coming out of poverty. It's not true, it's a dynamic line. In the margins of survival, people descend into poverty and come out of poverty with even a few thousand rupees of difference in terms of income. Six crore people. That means if you improve health care, ensure access to the bulk of the people in this country without out-of-pocket expenditure, then there is no need to do anything else to end poverty. That alone will end poverty in a few years' time. If you take the out-of-pocket expenditure, we have the highest OOP in the world. Indians spend about 58 to 60 percent of the total healthcare expenditure out of pocket. The government spends only about 25 to 30 percent. They claim to be spending 33 percent because nobody knows the total health expenditure in India. Every year they keep changing the number. Government expenditure, we have some idea, but the total expenditure incurred by all of us together, we have no idea really. I mean, years ago we used to talk about 4.2, 4.3 percent. Now we're talking about 3 percent. I don't know how it came down suddenly. Common sense tells us the expenditure is growing, not coming down. But it's not more than 30%, probably as low as 25% or lower, the government health expenditure. Again, one of the lowest in the world. You take, I'm not talking of the rich countries, take the comparable countries, China, Peru, Thailand, other countries, all of them are at the range of 3, 3.5% of the GDP spent by the government. India spends around 1%, 1, 1.1, minor variations here and there. Two thirds of it, spent or 70 percent spent by the states, about 30 percent spent by the union. Dr. Anil, who escorted me to this place and I were discussing briefly in the car, we don't need to spend 9 to 10 percent GDP to improve health care in India. That's unaffordable. Even if we want it, even if we wish it, it will not happen. The good news is if we spend just about 0.5 to 1 percent GDP additionally, we are spending 1, 1.1, 1, 1.2%. Just 0.5 to 1%. Start off with maybe 0.2, 0.3% incremental increase every year. And reach 0.5 to 1% extra. That means up to 2% you go over a period of time. If that is done judiciously, there will be a remarkable improvement in the healthcare outcomes in the country. There will be no descent into poverty. There will be access to practically every single person in this country to reasonable quality health care. We will not meet American or British standards overnight. That's absurd. But we will certainly create conditions where a lot of unnecessary morbidity and mortality will dramatically decline and disappear. How? Already you are showing the way. I am only preaching to the converted. What you are attempting, what you are thinking, your mission, your vision, your action are exactly in line with that. Morally talked about three or four outpatient visits in the country. Actually, the government institutions in India on an average have 0.5 outpatient visits per annum per person. The private sector has another 1.5 to 2, but most of it in the private sector is to, with the unqualified, untrained, informal rural health care providers. About 70% of the first point of contact in private sector is this unqualified, rural, informal medical care provider. I would not call them practitioners. Now, some of them may be reasonably good, and with chart GPT, et cetera, as Murali is talking about, maybe if they are smart enough, if they care enough, they may pick up. But I think the bulk of them, patients are surviving because nature has been very kind. As Ostler said, if you recall, the old-fashioned book of Ostler, he said with great humility as a great surgeon, I only dress the wounds, 
nature heals or god heals thanks to the propensity of nature to save most of us most of the time these people are surviving not because of medical care attention the first point of contact to me is what you are trying to do how do we improve the first point of contact the primary care for the people across the country utilizing a variety of things human interface i don't believe that whatever happens to technology human interface will disappear nor should it disappear i believe without that there is no medicine how do you improve access with available resources how do you utilize modern technology including telemedicine and chat gpt and a hundred other things but without compromising quality with adequate supervision and monitoring and accountability that is the heart of the issue the good news is we have remarkable strengths in the system again as murli said china is the only other country that produces larger number of doctors we produce 90000 in the country and about 10 15000 graduate outside the country remember ukraine how many people have you brought back to india or russia or some other country even china 100000 doctors a year numbers wise there is no problem quality wise again as has been mentioned certainly there is a decline in the clinical skills at undergraduate level for whatever reasons i don't want to go into details you know i know we all understand what's happening but numbers are not a problem same in the case with the nurses with physiotherapists with pharmacists with others there's an enormous number in this country numbers are not a problem unlike countries in africa other parts of the world their problem is where are the human resources we don't have that problem improvement of quality we can easily do it for instance you can improve medical uh, education undergraduate education by simply adapting the british practice of uh, objectively structured clinical examination oski or things like that we do have 50% Uh, weightage for clinical uh, methods but in reality nowadays if i'm not mistaken there is nobody who feels that he has to master clinical skills in order to graduate in mex spurious medicines are different that is because of poor regulation but the actual genuine medicines we are world class at the lowest cost in the world the moment our people went into aids therapy across the world art the drug prices globally plummeted by about 90 to 95% that's just one example a vaccine industry is a world champion we produce the best quality vaccines at the lowest possible cost in the world and humongous about 50 60% of the world's total vaccination uh, production is in india and all of you acquired skills and you are now doing things which are unimaginable at the lowest cost possible in the world when vajpayee as prime minister got his knee replacement in mumbai uh, we all thought my god it was wonderful and i remember when as a medical student many of you must have heard not the younger generation but our generation uh, we remember when akhil and nageshwar or the late uh, thespian when he went abroad and got the coronary bypass done he used to tell us stories and we used to wonder you know and now i think in hyderabad city you do about 200 bypasses a day about 2 or 300 knee replacements a day in just one city so remarkable things have happened at the lowest possible cost you all mastered that that ability not only to transfer the technology but do it in an indigenous manner so that the costs are brought down without compromise in quality so we have phenomenal strengths how do we leverage them to improve the quality of care without having to spend the kind of money that the west spends because we don't have that kind of money and for those who have some some genuine belief that insurance will be the answer no it will not be the answer i am for insurance all of us probably have insurance my family has insurance but it will never be the answer to address the healthcare needs of india for the next 25 to 30 years 90% of indian people are in the unorganized sector without a monthly regular wage we have the highest unorganized sector in the world insurance by definition requires a secure income and a secure employment almost always you deduct the 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 deductibles at the source employment you take medicare you take medicaid you take other things it will not work without that in all of india today with all the talk of insurance out of the 4% or so gdp that is spent on healthcare in the country annually just about under 60% even the 28000 crores are claims are only under 60% 11 lakh crores you are touching 1 to 2% so insurance while it should be encouraged i have no quarrel with that 
But a pretense that insurance is going to be the salvation to India's healthcare challenges is absolutely not borne by the facts or logic. It has to be by a judicious combination of public sector and private sector, public-private partnership. Now, let's come to primary health care. To start with, if we simply have a pool of physicians available, because we have to bring in competition and choice, even if the government funds it, if it's merely a PhD doctor, more doctors deployed, salaries paid, and we ask them to take care, why did it not happen so far? Those days are gone. To expect things to happen routinely because you employed somebody is no longer a realistic option. Of course, there are still outstanding doctors in the public sector who are doing remarkable work, but that's an exception, not the norm. I was seen in a place called Parvatipuram in Andhra Pradesh years ago when I was doing an intensive study of what's happening in government healthcare institutions. A doctor couple, they work with such dedication that for one rupee spent in that hospital, area hospital, the people are getting a benefit of 10 rupees. But to expect that everywhere doctors will act with such integrity and commitment, it's a bit unrealistic. So we have to bring in competition and choice. Even with public sector provisioning, the actual provider of the service need not be a public sector person. There has to be competition. Therefore, if you have a pool of physicians in a small town, with a catchment area of, let's say, 100,000 or so, let's say 10, 15 physicians are available, a catchment area of about 100,000 or so population. Then you have competition, you have choice, you have economies of scale. You cannot have diagnostics or pharmacy with a small number of outpatients a day. Without bothering you with the detail of the calculation, I can assure you, all we require would be about 100 to 150,000 physicians, and we are producing 90 to 100,000 in a year. If you just orient them a little bit to family medicine for a month or so, because they're already graduates in medical sciences, we can assure them a net income in the initial phase of their professional lives after undergraduation, about a lakh of rupees to lakh and a half rupees per month. It doesn't cost much for the country. Provided we utilize them very smartly, provided we have economies of scale, Secondary care, one, and the other benefit of that is referral will be the mainstay for hospital care. Again, Dr. Anil was telling me that the AMS in um, Mangalagiri used to have 250 outpatients. Initially, now there are 4,000 outpatients. It is a sign of our failure, not success. AMS New Delhi has about 12,000 outpatients a day, world's largest number. The nation's premier medical care institution attracts 12,000 outpatients a day. It's an insult. All the major clinics put together, they get about 700 to 800 patients a day, outpatients. An apex tertiary care institution getting tens of thousands of outpatients a day is a sign of failure of primary care. Patients that need not have to go there are forced to go there. So unless you have primary care which takes care of the bulk of the things, particularly in your own specialty, diabetes and endocrinology. I remember years ago when I was in King's College, London, I chanced upon Dr. Michael Edwards, the great diabetic food specialist. The moment he heard that I was from Hyderabad, he said, ah, the diabetic capital of the world, he said. South India, diabetic capital. I didn't know until that time that we have very high incidence of diabetes. Take your specialty, for instance. We all know. There's almost no significant non-communicable morbidity which is not linked to diabetes. Almost all morbidities, including even cancers. I was surprised, actually, I didn't know much about that. When I was referring the other day, I discovered that even for certain cancers, diabetes is a, a risk factor. Now, diabetes is not something you require a big hospital treatment as Dr. Sham was mentioning. We all know that. That's the reason why you started this idea clinics and this whole mission you started. If you don't detect early, if the lifestyle is not changed, if there's no regular proper management from the beginning, you cannot improve the quality of life, you cannot reduce morbidity or mortality. You have acute kidney failure or chronic kidney failure, um, uh, all kinds of Kimmelstein, Wilson disease, if I recall. Is it that? What is the syndrome? You have diabetic nephro nephrotic uh, 
direct nephropathy kemal steen wilson yeah i'm trying to recall 45 years ago um thing so if we wait until that time you already lost the game it is the primary and family care that's going to address the needs of diabetic patients in 99% cases just to give an example almost everything only 28% of the mortality in india is because of infectious diseases or communicable diseases so even that is declining or should decline should become near zero and it is going to become close to zero but 72% already in the non communicable diseases and they cannot be addressed with dramatic interventions on day one unless you allow them to fester into crisis and then have high cost but low impact interventions causing enormous strife and cost to the society and to the families we are not going to really address the challenges so once the family care is taken care of let there be a referral system unless it's an emergency to go to hospital and we already in the public sector have the framework it's not working very well because government is not deploying enough resources but arogyashree and ayushman bharat framework is the sound framework the basic idea competition choice and guaranteeing quality because of competition and choice if you deploy more resources and expand this care to almost every intervention minus the high cost tertiary interventions and that's where i believe it's wrong because eventually if you allow high cost tertiary interventions to be uh, to be dealt with in this manner it will be a bottomless pit the costs will go up the benefits will come down that's not the way forward for a country which is scarce in resources but this arogyashree framework we properly deployed and universalized i believe universalization is necessary not because everybody will use it but unless some of the middle class start using it with voice accountability will not be there in the quality of service if the service is only for the poor eventually the service will become poor it will not improve and the cost will not go up for the government because ultimately about 25 30% people again dr sham said the middle classes of india most of them will not use government facilities my daughter was born in a government maternity hospital probably the last child born of a civil servant uh, in a government hospital in the country out of sheer idealism she was born there she is a doctor uh, she is now applying for residency in the us so it's unlikely that middle class is usual but if at least some people utilize it if some people with voice are also stakeholders then the system is more likely to deliver better and therefore you must make it universal in concept you cannot parcel out healthcare only to some segment conceptually last element tertiary care i believe you must separate the high cost low impact but sometimes vital life saving technologies sophisticated technologies with multidisciplinary approach enormous cost of intervention they must be separated from the private sector as far as the public as far as the government is concerned that's where the good quality teaching hospitals are important there are about 300 government medical colleges of them about 140 or so are the old colleges relatively better but poorly resourced i was doing some quick study again dr sham made the point i don't have to repeat that on an average the cost of maintenance of a bed hospital bed in a high end tertiary care hospital in india is about 1.15 crores per year obviously it's high end maybe if you are cutting costs it comes to 60 70 lakhs the middle level hospitals but 1.15 crores is the cost the billing per bed is about 1.3 crores per bed one day i remember i was in niti ayog uh, my my friend uh, chambers uh, secretary niti ayog at the time and the chairman of one of the um, high end hospital chains he was there then i asked him what is the capital cost of investment per bed for hospital care tertiary care he said say about 1 crore this was about 10 years ago or so he said what's the billing per year per bed he said so 1 crore you know how much the government colleges are spending medical colleges on an average including the teaching component including a nursing college including the college component not merely the hospital cost it is coming to typically about 10 lakh rupees per bed per year Now how can you give quality care in the tertiary hospital with 10 lakh rupees per bed we can't make it one crore impossible but we can easily make it 25 to 30 lakhs over a period of time 
because government has advantages of infrastructure and pooling and economies of scale and therefore even 30 lakhs will significantly improve the quality of care provided and this important proviso. Again, Dr. Murali Bharadwaj is right. Where are the quality clinicians in government hospitals now? Very rare, you find one out of 10 who really have the skills and who engender confidence and who have the credibility. Most others are merely they're there. Unless we create a framework in which many of you find it attractive to give some time, you can't be government employees, you cannot give full time to teaching, but certainly I'm sure many of you would be delighted to be teachers. And that's what the rest of the world does. If the best practitioners are outside the government, not utilizing their talents to teach the next generation is ridiculous. If you give a, a, a reasonable framework in which you have the autonomy and you don't want to make much money, at least your co costs are covered for those hours that you spend there, you'll be delighted to provide the care there and teach. So the benefits are A, you enhance the credibility of the public system and therefore patients are more likely to come and B, you improve the quality of teaching and training of the undergraduate students. You can design it beautifully, there are ways of doing it. All this together, the, my ballpark estimate and fairly detailed analysis and study you have done is about 1 lakh crores per year. And we can do it incrementally. Start off with 30, 40,000 crores, but properly, judicious expenditure, not merely more expenditure. In three years' time, you reach that level. After that, as the economy is growing, India, luckily, we are now, the economy is growing at 6, 7 percent, and unless we bungle very badly, in the next 20, 30 years, we're likely to grow at that 6, 7 percent. So as the economy is growing, as demand is picking up, as politicians realize the political value of this, the political incentive of this, they can put more money. So now if from 1% we go to 1.2% 1 1 now, we go to 1.7 or 1.8%, slowly we'll go to 2.5 or so in 10 years' time. It's not a big deal. That kind of resources we have. We cannot go to 7 or 8% in 10 years' time. Not even if God appears on earth. We have a pragmatic approach possible because you made it possible. The existing system made it possible. With all its imperfections, you made it possible. If you think smartly and do things wisely and adapt to our conditions, for instance, in the outpatient uh, management at the primary care level, I looked at the British model. What is the model of payment to the physicians there? Per capita. X number registered, per registered patient, X amount. In India, it probably will not work. Therefore, make it simpler per outpatient visit. So there's some adaptation required to suit our conditions, our unique requirements. These are relatively minor in the larger context, but some application of mind is required. If we do that, this is not something that nobody has attempted. Sometimes in India we pretend that our problems are unique, that nobody on earth has these. No, we are not so exceptional, we are human. All other societies grappled with these problems. If we learn lessons just like medical science, we learn so many things from the rest of the world, and then we are applying them to our conditions. Similarly, in the management practices, building a healthcare system, if you simply learn from the rest of the world and adapt it to our conditions, not blindly adopt it. Like we said, for instance, uh, there's no real possibility of insurance becoming the mainstay of healthcare financing in India, for good reasons. So adapt it to our conditions, smartly. Leveraging our strengths, overcoming our weaknesses, at a relatively low cost, because even at 1.5 or 2 percent of the GDP, India, India government will be spending the lowest amount in healthcare. There's almost no significant economy which is spending less than 3 percent of GDP on healthcare from the government. Even then, we'll be the lowest costing from the for the government. But outcome can be significant. One last point. Again, Dr. Sham mentioned this year about a million patients from abroad, from the rest of the world, got health care in India and spending $13.8 billion estimated in 12 months' time. If we do a few smart things, already India is the largest destination of investment in health care in private sector, the world's largest destination. It's also the largest destination of investment in education in private sector. It speaks both of our strengths and our weakness. 
Weakness because they are convinced that government will never do its job well and therefore the demand will private sector and keep growing and growing and therefore let's invest money. But let's take advantage of that. If you do a few smart things, it will easily reach in the next 7 to 8 to 10 years a $100 billion a year. Easily. I mean, that's a conservative estimate. As Dr. Shyam said, globally the cost is skyrocketing, aging populations, people want high quality care, and there's no way those societies can afford that care at their costs. If we do things right, now we're attracting from the middle income countries, but not from the very rich countries yet. But if we do things right, all the big insurance companies, they'll earn a queue. And even NHS and others, they'll be more than happy to come here, at least in select interventions. We'll make it $100 billion. And look at employment. India employs about 3.2 million workers in the total healthcare system from pharmacists to doctors to nurses to lab assistants to all kinds of people, 3.2 million people for a population of 1.4 billion. Britain with a population which is about 4.5% of India's employs 1.6 million people in NHS. United States with one-fourth of our population, less than one-fourth, employs about 10 million people in healthcare system, public and private. The 3.2 million is public and private, the Indian number. Now, we cannot probably employ people on that scale for health care. About 2.8 to 3 percent of the population employed in health care is a little too much. We can easily reach about 1, 1.5 percent because we need it. If we build the system right, there are so many externalities. At least 10 million new jobs will be created in the health care sector. Not everybody is used to be a doctor. Health care sector requires a large number of people, all of you, in your clinics, in your hospitals, elsewhere. It's a huge employment generator. So if we think smartly as a country, enormous opportunities await us in the healthcare sector and what you're doing is phenomenal. I salute you for that. You're generating the ideas, you're putting it into practice, you're spreading it as a movement among physicians and above all, the doctors who only think of a patient and patient care are now, for the first time, I'm very delighted to note, refreshingly looking at the healthcare system and becoming champions of the healthcare system. And if the physicians don't take charge of this, don't take the leadership, increasingly in our society there's a, a, a gulf between the patient and the physician. When 40, 50 years ago, when we were at medical schools, doctors were literally worshipped. The amount of veneration of doctors was unthinkable. Today, increasingly, there is a suspicion, there is mistrust, there's a belief that the doctor is the enemy which is dangerous both for the profession and for the patient, we understand that. That's just a terrible thing. Particularly in a field where, again as Dr. Shyam said, the per capita uh, average span of life has increased from about 30, 32 years to about 72 years. We have a long way to go still, but we have done quite, quite a bit. Despite all the deficiencies, despite the government's failure, the medical profession has done a remarkable job in this country. If there's one area which is significantly successful, relative to the resources deployed, it is healthcare in India. Look at education, it is rotten in this country. We are at the rank bottom of the world. We have everybody going to schools and colleges but getting almost no knowledge at all worthwhile. I don't want to go into details. I, I never speak a word without evidence and logic. So we've done very well, and yet there's mistrust because the doctors are not seen as the champions of healthcare. Doctors have confined themselves to the cocoon of the hospital or the clinic and only looking at the patient with a microscopic view. We require a holistic view, and that's what you're bringing. I salute you, the Idea Clinics, and all of you for doing the remarkable job. I'm a great optimist. I believe this country can make much better life for people. Our healthcare can be significantly better at a very low cost because we already have certain strengths. But we have to learn to think afresh, honestly, intelligently, and apply the knowledge and adapt the practices elsewhere to suit our conditions. And with your leadership and with the continued involvement of people like you, I'm sure it will happen faster and better. I wish you all the very best. Thank you very much.